You know, a lot of people talk about hip hop and rap as if it's the same thing. And this is the beginning of a real hip hop education. There are universities that are teaching hip hop all over the country, oh, really all over the world. Uh, hip hop is being taught, hip hop courses, classes, you guys got one here. One of the things that makes your course authentic is when you leap off of the book and into real life. I have to commend you all and uh, Temple University um, and all of you organized, everyone who was involved in bringing me here on such short notice because this is what a hip hop course is really all about. And I'm going to explain this to you very quickly. Those that are taking notes, if, you, if I say something <clears throat> and you want me to repeat it, just shout that out. Say repeat it. I'll say it again. I'm going to run through dates, addresses, times, names of people, uh, and how this movement came to be what you are seeing. I'm going to give you 30, well, 34 years of history in about 20 minutes. Let's get started. 1970, the Vietnam War is going on. The Civil Rights Movement is at its peak. A gentleman by the name of J. Edgar Hoover is head of the FBI, Federal Bureau of Investigation, sometime in the 60s, 65 down. Also, as a side note, 1967, George Bush was head of the CIA. Side note. In the, er, in the these late 60s, the FBI issued something called a counterintelligence program. The counterintelligence program was supposed to be the FBI's way of checking up on and breaking apart uh, social organizations, women's groups, civil rights movement, what they believe the communists were, uh, uh, a workers' rights movement, unions, this kind of thing. J. Edgar Hoover was out to destroy that. When he got to the black community, documented evidence, FBI records show and state that he was looking for, I'll quote, a black messiah. <coughs> The FBI, with all their millions and all their technology, said that when it comes to the black community, what we are looking for is a black messiah. Those are the words, quote. They looked at Malcolm X, they looked at Martin Luther King, Kwame Torre, or then Stokely Carmichael. They're looking at all of these people rising up and they just start making plans to get rid of them. Not so much because these people were a threat to the United States, but because what they stood for inspired you. This is the real argument. The fake argument is Martin Luther King was killed because he was black. You know, they shot Malcolm because he was black. No. These things were calculated attempts, and even now, and I would say this now, now it's out that uh, the government, as you do more and more history, more and more research comes up, you come to find out that the United States government is blamed for a lot of stuff they themselves did not do. That when you reach a, a level of power in this country, you can do stuff and blame it on the United States blame it on the Justice Department, blame it on the Board of Education, when in fact there are groups of people with interests contrary to yours. It's just that simple. Some are black, some are white, some are mixed, some are, and when I say mixed, I mean some groups acquire an Asian-African connection 
It ain't got nothing to do with whether I'm African or whether you're Asian. I'm trading rice with you. I'm trading peanuts, corn, and other agricultural goods with you. I'm depending on you, you're depending on me, but we are manipulating the society for our good. This is a new paradigm in the civil rights struggle. Hip hop starts off in the Vietnam War, counterintelligence program, they're trying to get rid of our mothers and fathers. We're born in that. This is where we start, right here. We're born in that. Our whole generation was labeled X. <coughs> generation X. The whole generation is X because we were doomed. 1970, heroin is on the streets everywhere. There's a scene in the Mario Van Peebles movie, Black Panther, where they actually show this documented fact that happened, they actually acted out. It was a scene where the mafia and the FBI gets together to discuss how they're going to put heroin in the black community. You should rent Black Panther, continue your hip hop uh, studies. <laughs> but anyway, this was real. The government, working on behalf of other organizations, or working with other organizations, not about working with other organizations, launched a program to stop a certain intelligence happening, a certain happening already going on in the American societies. The problem was their own shortcomings of racism and sexism. Sexism hit them first. The plan was to get rid of all the men, assuming that women had no power and that without a man they would crumble. Hip hop has defied that law. We don't even discuss it no more. It's an old argument. If you're a single parent, now it don't mean nothing. Now, it's, it's actually better to be a single parent. There's more, there's more, there are more resources in society <laughs> for the single parent today than they're off of the family. Back in the 50s and 60s, to be a single parent was a, was a scourge. You was looked down upon. Well, you had uh, sex out of marriage or wedlock. Uh, where's your, your man? Where's your, where's your wife? Uh, or where's your, where's your companion? People looked at you and judged you based on this. After the Vietnam War, the heroin epidemic, counterintelligence program, most of the men are wiped out of the society. We, early hip hop, are born. I was born 65. I was part of that clique that grew up when we was in 72, 1972. I'm in the Bronx at this place called 1500, uh, 1520 Sedgwick Avenue. This is the birthplace of hip hop. 1520 Sedgwick Avenue. A guy named Cool DJ Herb used to play in 1500 Sedgwick Avenue in the Bronx. There was a park next to that building. And actually, I, we really lived in 1600. But everybody from 1600 to 1520 played, stayed over everybody's houses, that and the other. We had it was a great relationship between these two projects. And there was a park in the middle of that called Cedar Park. 1972, heroin is all up in this park. Fiends are nodding. The hot record was James Brown. Get on the good foot. I'm seven years old. Me and uh, Siobhan Dean, from, who's now Rough Riders and all of them, we all used to live in the same building in 72. Had no idea where anybody was or what we would become. It was just that Cool Herc used to come outside and play music. Now, here's where it all begins. Heroin is everywhere. Everywhere, everywhere. Heroin is everywhere, everywhere. It's not, not even like crack. Crack was controlled compared to heroin. Heroin was everywhere. Yeah. Young kids were on it. Old people were on it. Men, mothers, but everybody. Heroin epidemic 
of the United States. Somebody needs to do a book. Y'all should do a research and do a book on the heroin epidemic from about 1967 to 1977. That is an untold book, because if you ever write it, it's going to expose George Bush and the Reagan and Carter, all of them together. Our voice was never heard. When we watched on, others watched on television, Ronald Reagan said, we're going to do X, Y, and Z. The next day, it happened to us. If you want to see what life was like, if you want to see what life was like, Hold on one second. Oh, uh, where's uh, Malik at? I'll get him. Yeah, yeah, shut the doors. No one else is allowed in. Let them in either in groups of 10 or whatever. You guys are the last ones. Welcome to the session. Uh, let me continue. <clears throat> so 1972, Heroin is everywhere. The Vietnam War is taking young men out of the community every day. How many people are here 18? Anybody? You're eligible for the draft. Imagine getting a letter. I got a letter from the government the other day. I opened and read it. It said they were suckers. They wanted me for their army or whatever. Picture me giving a damn set. that Chuck D. laid down spoke right to 1972 when letters were coming to our older brothers and sisters saying, yo, Vietnam War, you have a one-year tour of Vietnam. And you either had to run down to Canada, go to jail, like Muhammad Ali, or go and fight that war. This was our reality. I'm seven years old. I'm aware of all of this. Just to speed you up to 2004, how many seven-year-olds are aware of the Iraq war, American war that's going on today? In 2004, how many seven-year-olds are aware of that? Okay, stop there. Go back. 1972, I'm seven years old. I'm aware of Vietnam, the civil rights struggle. I know who's the drug dealers, the cops, the crooked cops. The good cops. I know the gang members. I know whoever. I'm seven years old. This is the mind of the hip hop in the early days. Cool Herc is outside playing music. No flyers. You'd stick your head out the window and you hear. Yo, where that is that 123 park? Yo, is that 92 park? Yo, is that Cedar Park? Yo, let's go outside. You have to walk around, walk up one block. Nah, it ain't here. Walk up another block. Nah, nah, man, it's coming from up there. You walk up there, boom, boom, boom. Yeah, boom. Yo, that's 23 Park. They jamming in 23 Park. And you start walking to 123 Park, which, by the way, 123 Park was PS 123. It's where Africa Bambada in 1974 would start playing and introduce Zulu Nation. I'm not up to that yet. But I mentioned this Park 1911. I, I, I mentioned this, uh, this piece here because you gotta understand, also looking at hip hop today in its mainstream, back then, the way, the, the way we thought and acted was we don't want nothing to do with the mainstream. The, the reason we was called hip hop is because we didn't want to have nothing to do with the mainstream. Our parents, we already saw our parents come. I want to be down with your educational system. Get out of here, nigga. I want to be down with your American Medical Association. Get your punk ass. This is how our parents were getting treated. You know, I want to be down with the justice system. I want to be down. I want inclusion. It's the whole Martin Luther King argument. I want to be down with what you know. I want to be down. This is the civil rights argument on one side. I want to be down with you, America. Open the door and let me in. Malcolm X said, rethink the whole thing. 
Hip hop took that advice. In American history, you are hearing Dr. Martin Luther King's advice, which is an excellent advice. I, I would sum Martin Luther King up in this way, generalizing his philosophy in this way. This is what makes Martin Luther King so dope, is that he taught that in the face of hypocrisy, lawless lawmakers, when the people who make the laws are breaking them in front of you, your highest weapon is to stand in the law and by showing them the mirror image of their own hypocrisy, you bring about justice. To do that, you have to let the dog bite you. You got to stand there when they're shooting the water because your purpose for standing there is that this is a hypocrisy to your entire way of life. If I don't stand here, the hypocrisy will not be heard. It will not be seen. If I don't march, nobody will know that there is hypocrisy as you're throwing stuff, spitting on us, and doing all, you know, shooting guns and stuff. Yet we have to show the hypocrisy. So Martin Luther King taught us that. Stand up in the face of hypocrisy with justice. Be justice. Don't look for it, be it. That's what Martin Luther King taught us in passive nonviolent resistance. Don't break the law, uphold it beyond the criminals that are coming after you. Martin Luther King was still care in front of him. We just didn't take his advice. <laughs> Malcolm X said it. <laughs> Tear this whole thing down. <laughs> Nothing here works. The only solution is separation. Uh, that's it. Uh, if, Martin, if Malcolm X was here today, I guarantee he would have a problem with this whole reparations argument that we are having as, a, as an African community. If you really read Malcolm X and his thoughts on self-determination, self-evidence, that kind of stuff, what black people should be doing within and for themselves, we contradicting that. What we still doing is, I want to be down. I want what you got. Everything the white man get, we want. Every validation the white man aspires to, we want. And that's some controversial talk, I'm telling you for real. But hip hop didn't go there. 1972, we said you keep your mainstream. Keep it, we don't want it. We tried to get in your dance schools. You dissed us and dissed our parents. Now we create and break it. And now none of your dance schools can make money unless you have breaking in it. This is what we knew in 72. Don't think hip hop is a mistake. Every step of the way, we were thinking, thinking. Stop the violence movement, human education against lies, all in the same gang. Thinking, thinking. This is not no haphazard thing. We knew from the beginning exactly what we were doing and how we were going to do it. And what was the point? Peace, love, unity, and having fun. Africa Bambada, 1974. Peace, love, unity, and having fun. 1974, a gang member named Lance goes to Africa, meets the Zulu chief, sits down with the Zulu chief. Somehow he impresses the Zulu chief so much that the Zulu chief makes Lance a, 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 what is called a Zulu king. Lance comes back as an honorary Zulu king to the Bronx in 74 and calls his new organization Zulu Nation. And Lance changed his name to Africa Bambada. It became Africa Bambada and the Zulu Nation in 1974. And with that declaration came peace, love, unity, and having fun. But in 1979, the Sugar Hill Gang came out. Stop here for a minute. From 1970 to 1979, heroin is crazy in the community. From 1970 to 1979, black men are being arrested for no reason. You don't experience that today. This a, like today we have racial profiling. I like laugh when people are like, you know, when it comes to racial profiling, 
You ain't got no racial profiling in this. Today in 2000, no. We were racially profiled. Take it back, do the research. The way society was, was crazy. Crazy. People were getting lynched. In the seventh, in 1970, the Ku Klux Klan was still marching. In 1976-77, our parents were either warriors or cowards. There was only two parents we had. Warriors, and there were many of them. And there was cowards, and there was many of them. Some of them still around. <laughs> Some of them steamrolled your CDs a few years ago. Say gangster rap was detrimental to our children's development. Them same people that front in the 60s. When Dr. Martin Luther King took a bullet, Jesse Jackson was nowhere to be found. Now I'm not saying nothing. I'm not saying nothing. Come here, listen to me on this point. But this is hip hop. And let me take you to this level. Here's the history right here. Who cool Hurt saves us from heroin. The Vietnam War, our dads are gone. The United States government slips, thinking that if you kill the man, the woman got no power. Women raised us. Most hip hoppers are from my generation, are raised by single moms. That gave us a whole different psychology. First of all, we had that feminine creative energy as men. Other men were playing with G.I. Joe. G.I. Joe, macho, I wear blue, not pink. <laughs> Hip hop, raised by a single female, took on feminine psychological traits. Something that this country has downplayed since its inception. Everything is masculine, and everything is analytical in its masculinity. Creativity is a feminine attribute of the mind. Creativity. See, the plan backfired. They took away the analytical identity of us. The black male's intellectual identity was taken away in the 70s through the image of the father. The mother was all that was left and she gave us intelligence and creativity. We used the creativity to say, you know what, you dissed my moms, I don't even want to be part of you. I see Capoeira martial arts and I see James Brown. I'm gonna combine that and I'm gonna become what's called a B-boy, a B-girl. I'm gonna combine Capoeira martial arts with James Brown and create break dancing. I'm gonna take the hieroglyphics, the concept of Egyptian hieroglyphics and the concept of cave art that appeared some 20,000 years ago in Northern and Southern, and Southern Africa. I'm going to take that concept and I'm going to put it all over the streets that I live on. It's called graffiti art. I'm going to express my intelligence whether you tell me I can or not. I'm going to dress the way I want to dress whether you tell me I can or not. I'm going to be me whether you tell me I can or not. Our parents, most of them, were waiting to be told they can do this, they can do that, it's okay to do that, it's okay to do that. You know what that argument is? She's the first black woman to win a something. That stupid talk. Oh, you so articulate? That. Th 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 that, waiting for someone to validate you, for you to say, now I exist. Most college students, you guys go through this all the time with validation, as opposed to validating yourselves. 
in this instance, take it, this is a hip hop parable here, and I'll get back to the history lesson. This year, when you go to your graduation, or whenever you get to your graduation, <laughs> whenever you get to your graduation and you pick up your receipt, I mean your degree. <laughs> What I'm talking about. You see, there's something to be said about being free and being freed. Our parents were freed. We are free. Our parents were free. They fought for all of our freedom. They were freed. The Emancipation Procrastination <laughs> Proclamation <laughs> is supposed to, and actually the Emancipation Proclamation doesn't really free the slaves, actually. Uh, it's the uh, United States Constitution, thir 13th Amendment. Uh, uh, the 13th Amendment actually deals with slavery and abolishes it, or uh, deals with it, I'll put it that way. Close that door for me, please, thank you. Come on, come on, come on, thank you. You know, uh, I mentioned this, because the difference between being free and being free is when you are free, self-creative, self-evident, you self-actualize. Free is, I can't move until I get this authorization. I'm not a business major until I get a business major's yeah. degree. Yeah. I'm not a computer engineer until I get the computer engineer degree. I'm not a doctor, really, until I get the doctor's degree. Wrong! Hip-hop looked at it the completely different way. We said, I am. Said, I am. I have no credentials, no validation, none. But here's the difference between me and you. When someone says, what is your name? You say, my name is Bob, Bob Barker, how you doing? <laughs> when you ask a hip hop, what is your name? Yo, I'm DJ Bob Ski from 125. <laughs> the difference in psychology is this. Yo, man, I'm just some um, Bob Barker. <laughs> That person is like that because they are connected to their, in other words, their well-being is connected to something outside of themselves. You get this low self-esteem when your well-being is connected to something outside of yourself. This is the beginning of poverty right here. I want, meaning that I don't have. And what I want is more valuable than what I already have. The mainstream told us, they said, the mainstream said, everything that you have has no value. Your clothes, your furniture, everything has no value. The only way you have value is if you come through us, mainstream institutions, and on top of that, we're not letting you in. So look at, look at what we're up against. We're not letting you in, but this is the only place you can be validated. This is the only place we believe you should be, is in college, uh, in the army, in the, but we ain't letting you in. So we're sitting outside, ready to die. But we didn't. We said, because you're not letting us in, cool, keep everything you got. We're gonna create our own thing over here, and you're not getting in this. This here, we're creating. This was the attitude in 72. The attitude was, the record was, we got our own thing. Flash used to cut that up. We got our own thing, we got it. He used to cut that up, cats used to, it wasn't about the record. It was about that feeling of, yeah, we got our own thing, dressed different, man. Put on the lead suit with the bell bottoms, 
clocks, his hell glasses, can't go hack, got the graffiti piece on the back with a big boom box <laughs> to find all more in my presence. I'm blasting this box, loitering laws going across <laughs> the all sorts of peace and whatever the order is that is oppressing me is now out of order. I have sound and light. Our boom boxes and our graffiti art taught the whole United States mainstream. We wasn't in college. We wasn't in none of that. We tagged on the college wall. <laughs> and people said, yo, what's that? Oh, it's a gang. Oh, it's art. Oh, it's not. Oh, it's this. What was the point? Here's the essence right here. When it was time to say our name, we told a story about ourselves that was better than what we were at that time. We, was, we spoke higher than what we were at the time. 1979, Rapper's Delight, a group named Sugar Hill Gang comes out. One of the most famous lines that all the kids in the ghetto would sing along with. Here's the line. So after school, I take a dip in the pool, which is really off the wall. I got a color TV so I can see the Knicks play basketball. There was another part that said, I got a Lincoln Continental and a sunroof Cadillac. And then, so after school, I take a dip. They didn't have none of this. <laughs> the people listening to them didn't have none of this. But this was the essence of hip hop. When I say I have nothing, legally, I have nothing. But I got a rag. I got a handkerchief, a rag. Dirty rag, this rag costs 10 cents to make a rag. I could go to Prada, because that's the validation, and buy a rag from Prada. And because I spend $400 on a rag on my head, I have been validated by Prada. <laughs> what we did was we said, give me this rag that you just wiped the furniture off with and the dishes and the car. <laughs> Let me put that on my head. <laughs> on the head of a man or woman that believes in themselves, a worthless rag becomes a $10 million fashion item. The rags that we wear on our heads, the handkerchiefs that we got on our heads, that's a $10 million business. When that started, those handkerchiefs were given away for free. You can't get those handkerchiefs for free today. We used to get them for free. They were so common and just useless. It's like, it's like hip hop saying, we're going to put rolls of toilet tissue on our wrists and that's going to be the new thing. And because we walk around like, you son, I got a joke. To roll the toilet tissue on the wrist. Yo, I got the clean one. What you got, man? Yo, the toilet tissue on the wrist. It was just that crazy that we put candles on, all this stuff. Start walking around like this. What's your name? Super Bob Ski? <laughs> Yo, take my gazelles off. Yo, listen, man. I got a Lincoln Continental and I was like, I don't have none of this. But this is what I thought of myself. When somebody said, who are you? I didn't say I'm broken, poor, uneducated, and going nowhere. Even though I was <laughs> bro, uneducated and going nowhere. But hip hop came upon all of us in the ghetto, 1972 in the Bronx. It just came on us. And all of a sudden, we started to reject the mainstream. And that was the essence of it. That's why cats that want to run to the mainstream today are playing themselves, and that's why we say they're not real hip hop.
concept of hip hop was create the parallel community. Create an entirely different community. We ain't hung up with racism, sexism, whether you're gay or straight, rich or poor, uh, Jew, Christian, Muslim, hip hop ain't got them problems. And this is what Africa Bambada was dealing with. He put a record out in 82 called Planet Rock. Excuse me, teacher. Yes. Yes, indeed. He put out a record called Planet Rock that included all races of people, but we didn't have a voice. Today they try to tell you that hip hop is an African American thing. It's not, in its essence. Africans, of course, we are the antenna to the universe, can't find all that. <laughs> However, when you discuss hip hop for real as a cultural movement, I invite you guys to watch movies like Wild Style, yes. like uh, Style Wars, uh, the graffiti art documentary, Style Wars. Style Wars, by the way, is a graffiti art documentary that shows it's, it's our only documentation of white youth participating in hip hop in a serious way in the mid 80s. Because people believe today hip hop is just a black thing and a black male thing, and all we're doing is ducking and pimping and all and talking about women and this, that, the other. And to be honest with you, you know, black women don't even buy rap music, <laughs> to be honest with you. It's, it's white women and white men, young white men, and some artists get a predominantly of, of white women that buy rap music product, the mainstream rap music product you see on the television today and on radio. And the struggle within hip hop, even today as a movement, is that what you see on television and radio does not represent the totality of us. We're not gonna front. <laughs> we more thugged out than your president, George Bush. But I will say this, that there is a balance to how we present ourselves from day one. We was always beyond race. Because like I pointed out at the beginning, here's the new problem. Most of our parents were against us. Imagine being black in the 70s, and before you even get out the door, your father or your mother or just your mother is on your back. Turn that noise off. Don't be writing on my furniture. Don't be. The white community. Oh, but don't even forget moms. Moms was poor with us. OK, that's the first line of defense. You get past moms and you get outside, the cops are right there. If you get past them, you get to the black intelligentsia. They got no time for you. You get past them, you get to the black church. Ah, oh, son, pull up your pants. Before I can be saved? <laughs> the civil rights movement will not let hip hop have its, its glory. We, the hip hop movement, don't know enough about the civil rights movement to give them glory. We don't know really what our parents did. We really don't know. But here we are, rebellious, talking back, lipping off, and don't know really what we're talking about. Our elders, the superior of our minds, are not teaching us. No one has leadership in the country. No one. White folk leadership is in shambles. Black folk leadership don't even exist. Asian leadership, you name it, any community, the leadership sucks. Any of them. The only time you see Dr. Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech is in the apartment. Where else do you see that speech? Where the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will sit down at the table of brotherhood at. That ain't happening nowhere but in hip hop. Nowhere. It ain't happening in the black community. No black still got problems. I'll make them Jamaicans, all oh, make them Trinidadians, all those Haitians, all those Brazilians, all the. We got all these problems. In our own community, then you put all them together, and all oh, man these white folks. Oh man, these white folks. What white folks? Well, those German white folks. Oh, those Italian white folks. Oh, those Irish white folks. Oh, that's it. Then we get together and say, oh, you know what? 
Them Asians. Oh man, those Asians. Well, which Asians? Well, they got Korean, Vietnamese, Japanese. That's the state of the world. Hip hop has risen way above that. So far above it that you can't tell Eminem that he's white. <laughs> He will challenge you. <laughs> and in a lot of ways, he's not. Because let me drop this bomb on you right now. I'm not sure that I'm black. <laughs> I, I'm not really sure about that. You know, as a philosopher and all, we do some deep thinking about our identity. And what is that? Black, white. But what is that, really? See, hip hop deals with that. We're not skirting around the issue. What is an African American? What is that? What do we call ourselves? Why are we calling ourselves what we are calling ourselves? That's why the first step in hip hop, change your name. First step, what do you call yourself? You want to be a hip hopper? First thing, change your name. Why? It breaks you off from a history you did not create. Here's my final point in my last 15 minutes. In college, you learn a lot about knowing. And you, you are seeking knowledge. But I'd like to invite you to a concept called unknowing. There is knowing and there is unknowing. Meaning, or not knowing, I should say. Meaning this. Your perception is built upon, or you believe that your perception is built upon what you know. I know that. I know this. I am aware of that. I am aware of this. That awareness creates your reality. The more things you know, the better off you are able to negotiate life. That's what knowledge does for you. It makes you aware of your environment, yourself, makes you a better you. Knowledge. But unknowing is an argument that says what you don't know is also teaching you. I discovered this in hip hop with my own life. It's because we did not know how to play musical instruments that we created cutting, mixing, scratching and the one billion dollar tool, the mixer. Had we had knowledge, we would have passed that. There'd be no need for it. It's because we did not know how to play instruments. We couldn't afford them. We didn't have access to them. We created, or was forced to self-create. Now look for a handout. Now, now look for some sort of reparation. Self-create. I don't know how to play live instruments, but I know I'm a musician, so I'm still beating on this table. Others said, I don't have a lot of instruments. Man, my music career is old, boss. <laughs> Mom, I want a music career. You won't buy me no instruments. Freed or free? I can't move unless, I can't be me unless you be you. That's free. Free is, Man, that guy can play a guitar tight. Man, did you see what Jimi Hendrix did with the guitar? Yeah, man, that was tight. You got a guitar? No. Nope. You got a guitar? No. Nope. I ain't got one either. But how are we gonna make that sound in our world? Well, you know, my mom's got a turntable. And you know, every time I move that needle, it kind of makes the same sound that Jimi Hendrix was making and that James Brown be doing it. This is what this is how we're thinking, just like this. Bob Dylan all was on the radio every day. 
And what if I listen? Wow, look. All right, yo, 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 check this out. We're going to do it like this. We're going to, she, she, oh, that was dope. <laughs> we know that the turntable is not a guitar, but in our minds, I don't know if you've ever done this as children, that you don't have the real thing. So you take any object and turn it into what you don't have. This is, this is the essence of how so this is called unknowing. It is resting in the fact that even what I don't know is teaching me as much as what I do know. That I am building the totality of myself, not just in what I know, but what I choose not to know. I don't need to watch CNN when I wake up in the morning to hear that a missile is pointed at my head. I don't know that I need to know that. I don't know that I need to wake up in the morning, turn on the radio, and hear ignorance. I don't know that I need to hear that. I am building me. Sure, I know things, but I'm going to stop myself from knowing some other things because the totality of knowing is making up my reality. <clears throat> Unknowing. It gets deeper. Unknowing goes into the spiritual realm. Unknowing goes past the intellect. Knowing is the intellect. Unknowing can become part in its higher sense or deeper sense. Unknowing is of the spirit. Meaning, intellect says, we want a car. Intellect says the goal is the car. And intellect goes A, B, C, D, E, car. You know, go down to the dealer, get the registration, da 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 car. The spirit says car. The intellect says I gotta go down here, I gotta do this, I gotta get to this, and I gotta do that. And when I do that, then I'll be able to do this, and that will get me the call. That's intelligent. That's logic, rational thinking. The spirit says, call. And the way the figure, the way the call comes, comes later, all that. Or how are we gonna get the call that the world will work that out. Call. live life like this, where you could just say, car, car appears. I'll tell you right now the secret, right here. This is miracle making. This is the last part right here. I'll cut it off. This is where hip hop really gets locked. This is how we divide the entire mainstream. They don't say this, but the war was us against the mainstream of the 70s. They lost. We already defeated the mainstream society. Corporate America, all that's under our foot. Today, as I tell you, there's no fear. Go into corporate America, we've already opened the doors. Don't be afraid. Don't think it's just white board men. They say, oh man, that's a little much for me. Walk into Coca-Cola, I am hip hop. You need me. Bob Skin, Super D, yo, what's up? It's my man over here. You can say all that on your resume. You don't just get your college degree. You rock that shit. You don't get a college degree like these other clowns. They're just going to walk up and get their receipt. No, when you get your degree, make a t-shirt out of it. Yo, for real, yo. I just finished college. What? I'm going to write a book on my time in college. <laughs> of my experience and rock it. This is the essence right here. This is it. If you can hear it, let me go back to unknown. Spiritual unknown. Those that pray, when you pray,
God does not speak English. Can we just establish that? Okay? God does not speak English or French, German, Spanish, none of that. God hears the groan of your heart. If you can speak from your heart, thank you, brother, and I'll add to that too. Uh, if you can speak from the groan in your heart, and this is real right here, the groan in your heart, the joy in your heart, the, the, the essence of your being, you express that to God. There's no words in that. This is a, a submitting. This is a, 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 a letting go. This is, a, this is not about knowing. This is about unknowing. I don't know what Temple University will think if I call up their instructor and say, yo, I'm, I'm driving through. You think um, we can put together something real quick and I heard you was doing a class. I'm coming through, you think we can put something together? The intellect says, no, you only got two days promotion. <laughs> Are you crazy? Temple University got all kinds of stuff going on. <laughs> what do you mean? They say, I'll be at Temple University. I have no idea who's gonna be there. I have no idea what, what's gonna happen when they come here. I'm looking at all of you now taking all this in. <laughs> Two days ago, I was not gonna be here. But my spirit got hit when I was in Atlanta. And I said, mm, why do I need to go to Temple? <laughs> I'm on my way to Washington. I was coming from Atlanta, I was supposed to go to Washington. We're doing a conference at NASA and all this stuff. We wanted to uh, NASA to walk through everything, the security check and the Patriot Act. And it, it, uh, I said, yo, we just, we, you know, we ran into my man right here. I got you to get him there. We all have him. And we said, yo, we heard about your course. You won't come through. Here you are. Here I am. Hip hop cannot be taught by words. It's the feeling we get when you hear that a conversation like this is going down. The feeling you get, God got to be there. Yeah. It's that feeling you get. That's hip hop. That feeling, other people hear a beat go by the car, boom, boom, whack. Other people are like, oh man, you're like, what? Who is that? <laughs> this, is, this is the feeling you get. Unknown. The things you pray for, you get them according to the consciousness of your own mind. Our God is a loving God. This idea of fear for God, I mean, this, this theological principle behind that, I would just discard that statement. But in all actuality, God is so right up on me. I would invite you to stop thinking of God as a person, as a being that you must speak to, and begin to understand that what you are calling air. This is not it. This is the greatest conspiracy of all time. I'm going to give it to you right now. Maybe you guys <coughs> will uh, write a book on it. Your time at Temple. The greatest conspiracy is of all time is when people were told that what they are inhaling and exhaling is oxygen. That's a lie. This is God. Always. This is, let me tell you this scientifically, even if you need to bring it there, because God is a scientist. Consciousness, our ability to be aware, we tend to think it comes from us. But the argument is that if we are separated from this for four minutes, what's the first thing we lose? Consciousness. Four minutes all the time to be separated from this substance. And the first thing is your heart don't stop. Your, 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 your lungs live all that. Keep going. Consciousness you lose. The brain does not even die yet. 
the first thing that goes is consciousness. You are conscious because you are breathing. Therefore, consciousness does not come from you. It is a gift from God. The more you breathe, the more you receive the gift of awareness, of consciousness. The minute you say, I'm not going to breathe no more, the contract is broke, and you go to sleep. <laughs> so what is really conscious? Is it us? who clearly are not conscious unto ourselves, we are receiving consciousness. Constantly. That is consciousness. What is conscious? Us? Or the air itself? Or even go deeper? The trees that are said to produce oxygen. What is really conscious? If air is supposed to come from the tree, the trees grow whether we are conscious or not. They produce oxygen for us. We are so interdependent on this oxygen that if you don't get this product of the trees in four minutes, you're over. But we cut the trees down. Boop, boop, boop. One tree, one forest after another going down. And what are we cutting, really? We're cutting off consciousness. This is the battle, ladies and gentlemen. Hip hop has realized it long ago. The battle is for your mind. People say it, but they don't really know what they're talking about. Awareness is the fight. What do you believe? They're cutting trees down to lessen your ability to think. Do you know that there are, there is less than, let's put it this way, since 1950, the oxygen you breathe, the air you breathe, has, I think it's 30% less oxygen today. You're breathing 30% less oxygen in the air than we are breathing than the people in 1950. Right now. The oxygen in this substance is leaving every day. Another 20%, 40%. We, the air we're breathing today, is not the air that Jesus breathed. Jesus was able to do all that stuff because the air itself was pure. The contrast. The consciousness that Christ received was pure. This is why when you're in the inner city, generation X, the consciousness you are receiving is small. Small. Try to travel. Less than 10% of all of the United States citizens have passports. And out of that, Blacks and Latinos? <laughs> Travel, get off your block. This is the first thing hip hop did. This is what the elements did for us. This is how we got educated. The turntables took us all over the world. Imagine, ignorant KRS. <laughs> high school dropped out, just got my GED. I'm in a, I'm in a shelter. <laughs> homeless, I'm in the shelter, 1985, homeless, living in the shelter. Let me go back to this real quick, let's give you a record, let's look at it, you never remember it. <laughs> the things you pray for, the things you don't get, are saving your life. If you have already made a commitment to your God, rest on that, because it's real. God is not fictitious, let me tell you. God is right here. <laughs> right here. Uh, in you, out, uh, you keep bringing God in and out of your life. And when you know that science, when you can understand that God is in the breath, that you watch what you say. 
We are manipulating God. That's what an MC is. We are the craftsmen of God. We get a chunk of God. Boom. And we go, it's a bitch. It's a hoe. <laughs> no, this is a pimp. <laughs> it's all God. All God. The MCs interpret God. And here's the contract. However you interpret God, that will be the God of your life. And you know, that's the, this is a bitch. Your sister becomes that. Your mom becomes that. Your daughter becomes that. Karma is no joke. Excuse me, teacher. Yeah. Okay. Ten minutes. Karma is no joke. It's an Indian philosophy. But it proves true for all traditions. Watch what you say. Don't say I'm ready to die if you're not ready to die. As MCs, the strongest thing you can do is link up with God. I bring God to all battles. And we have a lot. This is also why we're undefeated. Those that know my history will know we're undefeated. We always will be in any lyrical competitions. <laughs> the point is, I'm not really grinding. I'll give you my secret right here. You can battle me with it. <laughs> I'm not really grinding. It has nothing to do with what I'm saying. The secret to MCing is how you grunt and grow. I can say, huh, the the man, the fuck, the the fuck. When I say di 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 da di 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 da di di, this has no, this is not words. These are the manipulations of the God force that is around us. It's not about your words. It's about your crumb, your crony, your your character, your light. An MC that has real life shines better. Doesn't matter. Record deal, no record deal, rich, poor, whatever, don't matter. Wherever you go, you shine. And this is the essence. See, all of you are not MCs. But apply the MC lessons. This is only one element of our culture. But apply this, this element to your life. When you speak of yourself, MC, rap. Talk like you were the greatest thing that ever walked on this earth. Talk like nobody can stop me. My name is DJ. Whatever. And walk in that authority. When you walk in that authority, you will attract the reality of what you say. But here's the final point. Do you have the courage to be here? This is the final big leap right here. Do you have the courage to be you? That's why hip hop gets into so much trouble. <laughs> because we are not afraid to be us. If being me means I'm a thug, accept it. This is me. Matter of fact, you were now laid it out. I forgot the record. Uh, he goes, uh, it was his first record. He goes, I heard his part. Uh, oh, he says, uh, 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 you a paper chaser, you got your block on lock, remain in the G to the moment you expire, you know what it is. Don't be crying, it ain't nothing, you handle your biz. See, Castor says it's a juvenile, you don't hear dog here. <laughs> he laid it out right there, he said, you a paper chaser, you got your block on lock, remain in the G to the moment you expire. You remain a G to the moment you expire. And then he said, you know what it is? Don't be crying. You know what it is? Handle your biz. Cats don't hear 50 Cent referring to God in his rhymes. Nobody hears that. The Bible verses. Him saying, I'm here for a purpose. 
How many heard that? People forget Dr. Dre started out. Express yourself. NWA first record was a conscious rap record. I mention all of this because there are two types of people in the world. The free and the free. I'm not here to critique the free. I feel for the free. Most of my brothers are free. Most of my sisters are free. They're waiting for the government to give them something. They're waiting for the record company to fix the contract. They're waiting for Viacom to stop buying up everything. They're waiting for Clear Channel to stop playing the same junk on the radio every day. They're waiting, 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 waiting. When we are a nation right now, our only problem, lack knowledge yourself. Awareness that we are that. We don't know that we're that. So what happened? A one billion dollar culture goes to waste. Do you know that hip hop by itself can redo the entire educational system? Like by itself. I mean, forget all this government stuff. Let's just put out a platinum single. Let's drop a couple of platinum albums. And let's put this billion dollar industry into the educational system. Well, we got a bet for that for. We have enough money, resources, to take the entire public school system. Get what I'm saying? The entire public school system, from high school to kindergarten. Hip hop has enough economic power and wealth, has wealth and has power to create wealth, to revamp the entire educational system. We don't need nobody's help. What we need is awareness of ourselves. And it doesn't start with a whole bunch of, uh, 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 I'm coming now with you too. Uh, uh, <laughs> it doesn't start with a, uh, we all got to come together. I did that for 18 years, it don't work. <laughs> it don't work, it don't work. We got to get past that. We got to come on now, pick it up. You know, we got to get past that. Certain things in the revolution don't work. <laughs> now all of that, we got to get along. If we all just got to, if we all just, no. All we need is the one. One person. All we need is one person. One person. Even in this conversation today, there's only one or two people. No, wait, wait, we're gonna be proud. There's maybe five people in this room that are really serious. I'm not this is nobody. This is real. Some came just to hear KRS. Others got the CD probably. <laughs> some, maybe the same people, but some, only about five or six, really are serious. And what's serious about what? Serious about peace, love, unity, having fun in a lot. No one from my time made it. No one. When I was coming up, there was 100 MCs, 200 DJs, 300 people. What happened? It had nothing to do with the skill. It had to do with the light. I was standing in my purpose. I have so much to tell you. I gotta go. I was standing in my purpose. Big Daddy Kane stands in his purpose. Guppy Fresh stands in his purpose. Run DMC stood in their purpose. This is where the magic starts. This is where you perform miracles. Stand in your purpose. When you know what your purpose is, magical things start happening. When you stand in your purpose, doors that were closed to other people open up for you. I'm telling you this because I am a living proof of it. I'm a living example of it. I'm not supposed to be here in front of you. I am the opposite of what stands in front of a podium and that's here. I have the opposite credentials. <laughs> they have all, and I have none. <laughs> but, why do I have honorary degrees? Why does Harvard want me to teach them? Why? Why? It has nothing to do with it. Well, Chris, you put out some really good records. Uh, <laughs> it goes a little deeper than that. And this is what you guys, this is when you become the most important. 
Stand on your purpose. This is hip hop. Hip hop is not rap. Mm. It's not performing. Mm. It's living. It's living victoriously and free. It's knowing that I don't have to get a job if I don't want it. It's knowing I don't have to get married if I don't want it. Let me say that quick. I was married 14 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> The point is, I am self-actualized. Self-actualized. The university, I am glad that the university agrees that KRS-One should have been here. But we were coming anyway. Before we close, I, I brought some things with me. You have opportunities to get this. Let me tell you what this is before I go. This is my new album, Keep Right. Yeah. These are the advanced copies of this album, Keep Right. It comes out three months from now, July, actually more than three years, July 15th, this album comes out. I brought it to Temple. You guys can pick up a copy. It is wholesale price, not 15 to $16, 10 bucks. This is is a book that I just put out. Well, it's kind of old. That's about a year old. Uh, it's in all the bookstores. I did bring some copies with me in here as well to sign. That's also why we have these here. As well, so you can get the signature in case you want to go on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> However, uh, uh, I, I did put out a new book. It's called Ruminations. Uh, if you'd like to continue conversations like this in the privacy of your own home, there's about eight different topics argued from the hip-hop perspective in this book. Uh, this book comes with a CD as well. This is a CD of most of my lectures over the past eight years on various topics. Uh, Dr. Cornell West intros the CD uh, from when we did some lecture tours together. I just grabbed one from King College. Uh, me and Dr. Cornell West, he does an excellent piece on hip-hop on the front of the CD. Uh, the forward is by Tavis Smiley, who says some excellent stuff as well about hip-hop, and of course I wrote the book.